everyone. I'm Charna Davis Weesey. Welcome to UCF Expressions. Now, today we're going to talk about one of my favorite types of art with one of my favorite people. Welcome, Dr. Kristen Congdon, who is an artist and a professor and an author. And we'd spend the next 15 minutes <laughs> saying all the wonderful things you do. Oh, thank you. And definitely one of my favorite people. And we're going to be talking about folk art and in specifically a book you've written and a book you're writing about folk artists in Florida and here in this country. Right. Thanks for joining us again. I'm always so glad to be here, Charna. It's great talking to you. So I wanted to tell, you know, this book has come out now. Um, this is my book, Just Above the Water, which is co-authored by Tina Bukovalis, and it's about Florida folk art. And it came out a couple years ago. And now I am working on a book that is about um, folk artists in the United States. So we're focusing on 300 folk artists around the country and I wanted to talk about a few of my favorite ones today. Absolutely, let's remind people um, what folk art is. And um, there's different words and different forms of it, and it's basically artists who were not academically trained. People think of Grandma Moses. Right. But um, people who were not academically trained and they just kind of do it from their heart, the art of the people. Right, well, that's what people generally think about it as being. So there's an idea that usually comes from art historians that that is what it is. It's it's, it's art that comes from people who are not learning it in school. And then there's another um, definition that comes from folklorists, which says that it's art that comes from a community-based culture. So it's taught within the context, like a Native American context or a Greek context, um, but it can also be occupational or recreational. And so what, what we're trying to do with this, this book on folk artists in the United States is bring those artists together who we see as traditional and those artists who we see as maybe self-taught, that's the word that's usually used, and say that all of these artists, if you look at them within their cultural context, are both innovative and traditional. And you really, it doesn't only have to be paintings. It could be oh, all no, no, kinds no. of things. Oh, it's all kinds of things. And I want to talk about uh, several artists today who are creating in a variety of different ways. Okay, let's, let's, let's tell me. First, before we go to, how did you go about this? Did you travel to meet them? Well, I've been doing research on folk artists for almost 30 years. So I have a great um, amount of information on these artists, and for the last 30 years, I've been traveling the country meeting m as many as I possibly can. It's probably hard for you to narrow it down to 300. <laughs> it, it's very hard. We would like to do it as 500, but the book is already two volumes. And so the publisher is kind of saying, you know, you really have to say um, 300. Right? Okay, tell me about the first one. Um, so the first one I wanted to talk about was Leonard Knight, who I visited over oh, just a, several months ago. And he lives in Nyland, California, and uh, was born in Vermont, and decided to, he, well, God came to him and saved him. Many of these artists have some inspiration from God. And when he had that inspiration, he decided he wanted to make a huge hot air balloon. And it was, when he started making, it took him six years, and it was over 200 feet when a normal hot air balloon is 60 to 90 feet. So this was huge, and he never got it off the ground. And so he ended up- a lot of hot air. He ended up a lot of, yes. And well, by the time he had finished it, it was rotten. And so he moved to Nyland, California, which is by the Salton Sea down in the desert of um, Southern California, and started making a mountain that praised God. And he's been working there for a very long time. And people from all over the world now come to see his mountain, which is made out of adobe. It's mud that he puts together with hay. And it keeps going up and up and up. And then people bring him paint, old paint. And he paints the mountain. So it's this extraordinarily vibrant um, environment that you see out in the desert, which is kind of, you know, um, browns and dark greens, and it's huge. It's got a yellow brick road that goes up to the top. It's got a waterfall that comes down to the bottom, and it has all of these different sayings on it. And um, he has, when people come, um, he gives people these puzzles of Salvation Mar Mountain and DVDs. So, you know, it's free. And yet he gives everybody all these gifts because he's so happy that people come there. Now, how, how does he support himself? How does he do that? Well, he lives in the back of a truck. And the temperatures in the desert 
reach 120 degrees, but people take care of him. They just bring him um, food. Sometimes they bring him money. Uh, and they bring him all this paint, and the farmers around bring him hay so that he can make the adobe. And some people who live in the slab city behind there, uh, who live in these trailers that they come down and spend several months in, uh, come over and help him. And he gives everybody who comes a tour of the place. He's probably, Charna, the happiest man I've ever met in oh my, my life. Gosh. He believes that he has everything he needs. And it's an extraordinary and he does. place. And he does. <laughs> That's the other thing. He does. Sometimes he'll go into town in Nyland and sit and have coffee with people who will give him a little bit of a, you know, soup or coffee or whatever for free. He seems perfectly healthy. Oh my gosh. Okay, let's tell. Let, let me hear about somebody else. Okay. I'm ready to hear more. Well, Taff Richardson um, is one of the most extraordinary people I have ever met. He lives in Tampa. Well, he lived in Tampa, Florida. He passed away several months ago. And he, uh, an African-American man who believed that the community in which he grew up in was going into decay. It used to be a great little neighborhood where everybody took care of the children and neighbors knew each other. And then the freeway came through and split the community. And then it was zoned to have all kinds of um, industrial kinds of um, buildings. And the houses were torn down. So he lived in one house on this street that was just full of crime, drugs, the children were neglected, it didn't have that community sense, and he decided that in that house he was going to make the Garden of Eden, and he was going to teach children how to um, make art. Because if you know about creativity, you can imagine anything. And so he, his art, his own art, and this is going to sound a little bit iffy, you know, but he makes it out of roadkill the bones of roadkill. Because roadkill is something that everybody neglects, they don't want to think about it. Um, and so in his mind, the bones of that roadkill is all about the resurrection. Um, he says he learned about art in church, so it was came from our Father who art in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so he puts these bones together to resurrect them in a new kind of way that is these extraordinary um, powerful um, sculptures, sometimes animals, sometimes religious figures, and the idea that he wants to pass on to the children was that they can create from things, ideas, um, objects that have been tossed away, and they can remake themselves through all of that as and well. And if you can imagine it, if, without imagining it, you can't change your life. It's all about the imagination. Uh, and he sometimes said, you know, people didn't pay attention to him for a long way, time, but he's like a snail. You just keep doing it and keep doing it. And now that he's passed away, the city of Tampa is actually helping with some, a place called the Moses House, which is a place to teach children his messages. So oh, wow. people have listened. And um, it, there was one time when we came with a group of teachers um, from the Florida Humanities Council, 20 teachers, to visit him and the children were there playing drums to welcome them off the bus, to show them what the Garden of Eden is like, the place where growth and all kinds of um, energy is placed within the midst of all of this decay. I love folk art because it comes from reality. You it know, does. It's not, it's not there for the money, it's not there for the fame. Right, and oftentimes it's meant to change the world. The artists' ideas that they have are so powerful and they feel them so strongly that they want to share this, this vision or idea of what it can mean to be able to create something, um, particularly uh, uh, from a, with a message that's really important, and those kinds of things just spread out. Who's next? Um, Ginger Lavoie, she is a Polynesian quilter. And she has a very interesting story. Um, she grew up in the 60s in Kissimmee. And you know that was the time of the Beach Boys and surfing had just become a big, huge thing. And she decided she wanted to marry a surfer. You know, how cool was that? <laughs> and she understood that- A little hard in Kissimmee. Well, that's exactly right. <laughs> so she decided that the best surfers were probably in Hawaii. So probably. after high school, she went to Hawaii and um, found her husband, who was a great surfer lived there for 30 years on a small island and apprenticed herself to as many Polynesian quilters as she could find. And so she makes these gorgeous quilts um, 
and she is seen as a cultural bearer now, even though she's not biologically Polynesian, she is culturally Polynesian. And um, she moved back to Kissimmee to take care of her parents because uh, as they were getting older. And we have this very strong Polynesian community here um, in Central Florida where she is now teaching some of the relatives of the people she studied with the um, applique quilting that is Polynesian. It's amazing. It's really quite extraordinary. And our last one before we meet um, one of the students who's working with you on this book before we meet Greg. Okay, is Bola Simpson and he's from Lucoma, North Carolina. And he was in the military and he was really good with mechanics. He knew how to fix cars and engines and all sorts of things. And he has on this little plot of land that he has in Lucoma made these incredible whirly gigs out of junk again. And they have these um, uh, light reflectors on it so that at night, if you're coming by with your cars, they're moving with the wind and the lights are shining. So it's like a carnival and it's absolutely spectacular. And he doesn't sell them very much um, because he likes the idea of all of those whirly gigs in that space just Being making together. This, yes, right. So they're absolutely spectacular, and he's known around the world as well as a, a marvelous man and an artist. I bet these folk artists inspire you. I get so many ideas from them, and as a person with a PhD in art education, I recognize that there's a whole other world out there that we don't often learn about in our art history books. There's a whole other way of learning how to create, and it comes from the environment and our cultural context, and knowing what we know really, really well that maybe might not be taught in an academic setting. Especially art that's not meant to impress anybody. Right. <laughs> it's done because you need to do it. Yes. It eventually often does impress somebody, but that's not its intention. Whenever I talk to you, I want to go out and start collecting it. <laughs> I, I better do a lot more of these shows, though. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Maybe the book might be a good start. <laughs> that would be great. Yes. Dr. Kristen Condon, thank you. We're not done with the show, but Greg's going to come up after this break and tell us about the artist he's working on with you with his book. That's terrific. Thank we'll you. We'll be right back. <laughs> We're back. Meet Greg Moore, and Greg is an undergrad here at UCF, and you're working with Dr. Congdon. Are you a philosophy major? I am. So you're, you're figuring out the meaning of life, or at least what some people <laughs> thought it was? Uh, working on it, yeah, working on how'd it. You, how'd you meet Dr. Congdon? How'd you get involved in folk art? Uh, well, last semester, last fall, I took a aesthetics class with Dr. Congdon, sort of exploring the questions of beauty and how we define art and how we derive value from things those sort of philosophical questions and she taught it. Um, got to know her through that, got interested in folk art through her and ended up coming to her afterwards and those are the questions that I'm really interested in but the philosophy department here at UCF is not that geared towards questions of aesthetics and ethics so taking her class I got really excited and asked her what the next step would be and she said well I um, have a few different things that I'm working on that you could work with me further and she told me about this book she's writing and I got excited about it because I was getting into folk art at the time and went from there. Ended wow, up. you're going to really, you're going to really have an unbelievable base of knowledge <laughs> in a collection by the time you're, you're um, sort of set in your career. It's a great start and especially folk art like I was talking with Dr. Congdon, it's, it's so real and it's so raw when you look at it and you're so from the heart and there's nothing better to to delve into the meaning of things than, than, than some of these artists. Yeah, certainly. Um, that's one of the things that really drew me to it was that it's just so intensely personal and, as she was saying, intensely cultural. It's just so real and just a really honest expression um, of the artist themselves. So tell me about, you're going to tell me about some of the, some of the artists you're working with. Uh, yeah. Um, well, one of the first artists that I'll talk about is an artist named Ray Matterson. He's an embroiderer actually. Um, he grew up in a family of an alcoholic, ended up getting involved with drugs, um, ended up going on a spree of robberies with a toy gun and get, getting arrested to support his coke habit. And uh, landed himself in prison where he was angry at all these different people, angry at God, he says, and 
one day he just for some reason decided that he wanted to embroider so he fashioned a embroidery hoop out of old Rubbermaid while he was in prison while he was in prison oh my. fashioned an embroidery hoop out of a Rubbermaid container top um, got a sewing needle and a pair of socks from a guard and just went at it and started embroidering and he makes these they're like two inches by three inches these really little like baseball card sized patches that have like 1200 stitches wow. per square inch I think and they're just incredible. They're Amazing fine motor skills. Yeah. <laughs> so from there, he now he is working on getting embroidery programs started in prisons for other inmates because it's this been this. Is he still in prison or is he out? Uh, no, he was in prison for 15 years, but he's out now. Um, he wrote a book, an autobiography about himself and his story, and he travels around giving talks and. Uh, teaching people. Now, have you met him as part of this? I haven't met so him. So you're doing the research with it for Dr. Yeah, I, I corresponded with him a little bit over email just to get some images for uh, the project, but other than that, I haven't met him personally. Still, you know, these people, their stories are so powerful. His story is specifically very inspiring because it's such a, a journey from this person that was so broken and empty to a person that's been fulfilled and found meaning in life through expressing himself and telling his story in such a innovative and unique With way. Cloth, a needle, and thread. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about somebody else. Uh, another one that I've been working on and actually being from South Florida have been able to visit his space. It's not, he's not alive anymore, is Ed Leedskalnan. Um, he built the Coral Castle in Homestead, Florida. Um, basically his story, he was a Latvian immigrant, um, was engaged to be married to a woman that was 10 years younger than him. She was 16, he was 26, I believe. And she broke off their wedding the night before they were the ceremony. And he ended up traveling the United States, bounced around, spent some time in Canada, was diagnosed with tuberculosis, and they told him to come to Florida. So he came down to Florida, into Florida City, and decided to build a monument to his lost love. And somehow it's baffled uh, scientists since he did it. No one, he worked by night so no one knew how he did it, but he was able to remove over a thousand tons of coral and build this castle out of coral. Um, I wonder if that was legal. It's a good question. <laughs> Tell me why I did it at night without anybody <laughs> maybe, watching. Maybe, maybe. There's all, well, there's a lot of theories as to why he did it at night and how he did it. I mean, some of these pieces of coral are 18 tons and he did it all by himself. He was only five feet tall and weighed 100 pounds. So oh, wow. no one's quite sure how he did it. He said that he had the secret of how the pyramids were built, um, but no one ever saw him he working. never told anybody. Never told anyone. There's still people to this day that are trying to figure it out. Some people think that he figured out some way to electromagnetize coral rock and float it through the air, but <laughs> Wow, I no wonder if she ever saw it. She, she didn't actually. She, I believe, just died a few years ago and never did journey to see it. That's amazing. And it just show, goes to show you folk art doesn't have to be actual something, a piece of something that most people would think of as art. Yeah, I mean, his is uh, a lot like Leonard Knight that Dr. Kong was talking about. His is just this m massive monument to uh, something that meant a lot to him. And philosophically, his art was a vision from him and very personal and his meaning was very personal. Yeah, and it, but at the same time, um, just as Dr. Krong was saying, all these artists, there's cultural as well as uh, innovative aspects to them. His art at the same time was cultural because it brought a lot of the people together in Homestead. It was something that when he was alive, people would come and pay him 10 cents and he would give them tours. He always had kids around. Uh, he would cook hot dogs for kids and they would spend Sunday afternoons in the castle, which was, he called it Rock Garden Park when he was alive, but it's since been changed to Coral Castle. Okay, who's next? Uh, another one that I have to talk about is a Navajo Indian artist named Mary Holiday Black. Um, she's considered primarily responsible for reviving the Navajo basket making tradition um, with the rise of some of these folk art traditions. The Navajo um, pottery was really blowing up and a lot of the artists were moving towards doing that just because that's where the money was at. People were very interested in that and people were buying so much of the Navajo pottery. Um, and she 
began making these Navajo wedding baskets and uh, actually angered some of the other Navajo Indians by starting to incorporate the folk stories that usually weren't depicted um, in baskets and sort of broke the mold a little bit. And Was her, that because it wasn't supposed to go outside of their culture or it just? Uh, I don't know. I just, th I think primarily that it was just, um, that it wasn't supposed to be depicted in that form. The baskets were just for ceremonial purposes um, or for wedding purposes. So they weren't typically used to display these stories. Gotcha. gotcha. So that, that sort of broke the mold a little bit and angered some people. But since then, it sort of opened this whole door and revived this tradition. So now there's all these different artists. She actually has 11 children, nine of whom are now well-known Navajo basket makers. Cool. Did you meet her? I did not. I have not met I her. She actually doesn't to. speak any English, so oh, I don't I know it's what hard, it would be like you know? to meet. I bet you want to go there and <laughs> yeah. get to know them. Yeah. I would love to. I would very much love to. Okay, who's next? Uh, the last person that I would talk about is Nicario Jimenez. He's um, a lot of times called the artist of the Andes. He makes Peruvian retablos. He's a Peruvian artist. He was born in Peru. Um, retablos are these uh, depictions of saints. They originated in the 16th century with um, priests that would travel through the Andes and they would carry these big wooden boxes with figures inside of them that would depict religious stories and they would use that um, for their mission work to tell these stories to the native people. And it sort of took off from there and a lot of the indigenous cultures took them over and started telling their own stories. Um, and Nicario Jimenez learned to make the retablos from his grandfather and his father. They both make them. And he worked there in Peru, but then with the rise of the Shining Path guerrilla movement and all this political turmoil, he was forced to flee the country and he actually came to Florida. He now lives in Naples. And his work has changed a lot from being very traditional. He still makes some of the traditional like hat market scenes but he also makes scenes of Chicago and New York, um, of the World Trade Centers, and other political and social movements here in the United States. So you, you went into this wanting to know a little bit more about the philosophy of beauty and aesthetics. Have you, have you gotten some of that? Or is it usually with philosophy, it opens up more questions, which is probably yeah. a good goal, too. Yeah, <laughs> um, I think that it's opened up more questions. I think that. Um, where I'm at with it now is that I really understand that there's more to beauty than just the surface, what appeals to the eye. I think it has a lot more to do with the stories and the context that really makes these things incredible and really draws us, at least with folk art. I, I don't think you can discount fine art either um, and these things that are just visually incredible, but at the same time, folk art and these things that have stories, they're also visually incredible, but the story just really makes it. I guess the answer is to take the time to look at it more than just what you're seeing for a moment. Yeah, there's more than deeper. one angle to look at things from. <laughs> more than one side. Certainly. Greg Moore, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. I really do appreciate it, and it's I hope that pleasure. you and Dr. Congdon come back when the books are done. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> are you going to be able to stay with her all the way through? <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> Fingers we'll see. crossed. <laughs> I would like to. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm Charna Davis Weesey. Thank you so much for joining us for UCF Expressions, and we hope to see you next time. Mm -hmm.